greeting one another that that song I referred to is not a new song, it's an old song. It's not an old song, it's a new song. I just heard it this week on my radio. New truck, it's a new song, I, I don't know. Uh, I want to uh, say something now and I want to be understood properly. Uh, I want you to be in prayer for our young people going to school. Uh, we've got some young people going to high school and it's such a different day as when I went. And my dad gave me very strict instructions and he didn't care what the church, of, I mean the school officials or anybody else said. You watch after your little sister and you take care of her against the mongrels and the hounds at the school. And we've got some young ladies that have surely grown up in our church and uh, I, I've been praying for them for years, praying that God watch over them, but they're going to high school this year and you be in prayer that God would put a hedge around these young ladies and keep the hounds away from them. Amen. Uh, Daddy and Grandpa and Preacher, we can't go to school and do what one day we could. You do, you're just not allowed to do that. But uh, days have changed. Some of you are familiar with the, uh, he's retired now, the big basketball player, Shaquille O'Neal. He was a big, always big, by, by that I mean really big. Uh, if he's if he's just seven foot, all the other seven footers in the NBA are lying. <laughs> all right, but he's huge. But he went to high school, and he got to showing off one day. Unbuttoned his button down about halfway in his shirt, and he's I read his book, and he's walking around in the class and showing off, and the teachers really couldn't do anything with him. But in reading this book, he said, I don't know how he knew it, but my dad knew what, that, that I was acting up. He said, I was walking around in, right in the classroom, and he said, all of a sudden, I looked in the doorway, and there stood my dad. He didn't stop at the office, get permission or anything. He just showed up. And he said he drugged me out and dealt with me right there, and he didn't care who what. I know these days we can't do that. We can't walk around. Diana keeps threatening our granddaughters, Abby and Haley, that she's going to make me a big brightly colored shirt that said I'm Abby's puppy or uh, Haley's poppy, and then I'm going to wear it. And I keep telling them, you're going to look around, there's going to be a new janitor at your school. <laughs> Me. You'll see some big old bald headed guy there leaning on a mop. And I, all I'm doing is watching. I can remember some of the talk back in the late 60s and early 70s that I heard some of the boys saying about the girls. I doubt very seriously they're any less immoral in these few years. Am I making any sense? God help us to be in prayer for our young people. When I first came to this church, there's a little blonde-headed girl running around, a little skinny girl. And now we have Anna, just grown up. Pray for these young ladies. Pray for our young people. Pray that our young men will be young men for Christ. What they, and, and, and that they won't be just like the animals that are there. I hope that makes sense. Now, Isaiah 43, verse 1. We're going to finish. Well, we're going to try to finish what I started last week. Isaiah's Redeemer. I began studying about redemption and redemption and 
There's just so much in the scripture. We're going to read several verses, but not a whole passage like we did last week for time's sake. Verse 1 to verse 7 of Isaiah 43. Last week we read Isaiah 44. Reading in Isaiah 43 now, verse 1 down to verse 7. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not. For I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. In the Song of Solomon we read, My beloved is mine and I am his. I'm glad I know where I belong. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire... Thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For, or because, I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Seba for thee. Since thou wast precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. Therefore will I give men for thee and people for thy life. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will, bring the, I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from far and my daughters from the ends of the earth. For everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory." I have formed him, yea, I have made him. God help us. Now this is speaking prophetically of the nation of Israel. God's going to gather them and they are returning to Israel as we speak. But we can see this. We are the people of God. He's called us. He's formed us. He's created us. He's redeemed us. We are his It's not about you, it's not about me, this is not my life, it's not yours, we belong to God. And it says here, I have formed him, I have created him. Verse 7 it says, for my glory. When I started out this study on redemption, the title I was going to work from was going to be either the flip side of redemption or companion truths to redemption because there's just so much here. But what I want you to see, you and I, everyone who has been redeemed, they've been redeemed from something to something. He redeemed us from our sin and it says for his glory. Why do I live? Why does God allow me to inhale and exhale and allow my heart to beat and allow me to live and occupy his ground and his world? And why has he entrusted me with this church and my family? It's for his glory. It's not for me. God help us to understand that. But we, we, last week we looked at the Redeemer's grace. The Redeemer's grace, we looked at chapter 44 and verse 1. Yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. God in His grace has chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world. And we see that again in chapter 43, verse 1. I've called thee by name. We looked at the Redeemer's solitariness. By that meaning, he is God alone. Verse 6 of Isaiah 44. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last. Beside me there is no God, the solitariness of God. There's not a plurality of, of ways to God. He is God, there's none else. He says in in chapter 46, I am God, there's none else. I'm God, there's none like me. We'll read that in a little bit later. And then we noticed last week, thirdly, the Redeemer's mercy. 
Isaiah 44, verse 21. Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for thou art my servant, I have formed thee. Thou art my servant, O Israel, thou shalt not be forgotten of me. There we see our Redeemer's faithfulness. Amen. Did you ever forget something? If you haven't, keep living. You get older, you'll start forgetting things that you, you should remember and remember things you wish you could forget. But look at verse 22, his, the Redeemer's mercy. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions and as a cloud thy sins return unto me for I have redeemed thee. There we saw on last Sunday the Redeemer's mercy. Two times in, in the book of Hebrews, 8, 12, and 10, 17, God says, their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. We sang a moment ago, are you washed in the blood? It, we're washed in the blood. He's washed our sins away. They're gone. Stains. And he's taken them away. He's removed all blemish, all sin. And that brings us this morning back in Isaiah chapter 43. I want us to see very quickly the Redeemer's love. We're looking at attributes, characteristics of Isaiah's Redeemer. In Isaiah 43, please, he has redeemed us, it says there in verse number 1. But look down, please, to verse number 4. Since thou wast precious in my sight, Thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. The Redeemer's love. He did not buy us, or redeem us, or choose us out of obligation. It, 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 we didn't just come in in a crowd. He redeemed us individually, personally. And he loved us. Jeremiah 31, 3, I've loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore in loving kindness have I drawn thee. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I love that. I'm glad that I can go all over this globe or send missionaries and they can tell people, turn to God and you can experience this wonderful love for the whole world. But more important than that, I have a tendency to be selfish. I'm glad I can read in the scriptures that God loved not just the whole world, but that God loved me. And he called me by name. Our Redeemer loves us. Deuteronomy chapter 7 said, I didn't set my love upon you because you were the greatest. He says, because you were the weakest. He said, I set my love upon you. I chose you. He says, because I loved you. If you'll study that at Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 7 to verse 9, you'll read there, God loved loving us. He loved us because he loved to love us. I get, start getting the itch when the month of August starts drawing to an end. I know fall is coming. It's going to begin to cool off. The next thing you know, it's October. I can archery hunt. See? And then November. Boom, I can break out the guns. I love Honey, I can remember a day when I thought it was awful. And I said, as long as I can buy meat, I'm not going to go hunt it. Till I got started hunting it and eating it. Eating that venison. Diana fixed a roast last week, a venison roast. I, you just want to fall in the pot. It's so good. It, it, you, anyway, foolishness. Back there. I love it. I'm not going to try to cover that. I just love it. I enjoy it. The idea here, what I'm trying to illustrate is, God didn't love me because I just kind of got in with the crowd. All right, come on. Uh, he loved me because he loved me. He loved loving me. 
If you're a child of God and you're under the wondrous umbrella and covering of the marvelous love of God, he loves you because he loves loving you. He didn't love anybody out of obligation. Well, all right, you, you just kind of snuck in. Come on, you're in the crowd. No, he loved us. The Redeemer's love. It's an everlasting love. It's an eternal love. It's a love that will never end in divorce. It's a love that will never end in death. I can remember my last conversation with my dad. He could not speak anymore. He could not swallow. We had to take one of those instruments and keep him from drowning on his own saliva. It was, to me, it was just sad because he was the strongest man I ever knew and wasn't an athlete. Uh, and, and I worked with him, and I had such a very close relationship, but I can remember holding his head in my hands and looking at his big dark eyes, and I could tell he's just telling me how much he loved me. And then I preached his funeral. I can't experience that love anymore. I can't tell him I love him anymore. Am I making any sense? So often love ends with a death. See? Not God. He's going to live forever. But you know what? So am I. Amen. He said, John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, if he dies, he's going to live. In other words, God's love for me is not going to end in his death. It's not going to end in my death. I'm going to live eternally with God, and he's going to love me forever, and I get the great privilege of loving him forever. Isn't that something? I wonder, do you love God today? 1 Corinthians 16, 22, a very terrifying passage of Scripture. I know Joel Osteen says, don't ever preach anything negative, but uh, there is a hell. If in, 1 Corinthians 16, 22, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, maranatha. I've had people tell, oh yeah, preacher, I believe in God. Oh yeah, preacher, I believe in God. That whole mob that crucified Jesus Christ believed in God. They weren't a mob of atheists. The Bible said the devil believes and trembles. I've been doing this 40 years, Houston and Arlington and Fort Worth and Grand Prairie and Ohio and Pennsylvania and in Tennessee, other places I've gone, I want you to understand I've met two atheists and one agnostic. Everybody else believes in God. But I'm asking you this morning, do you love God? Is the love of God, you see the love of God comes down and then goes right back up. Reciprocating. All right? God's love comes down, fills our hearts, we express it back to God. And that never stops. His love never stops coming down, our, lever, our love never stops going back. Sometimes it gets a little bit distracted, ours, not his. God help us, the Redeemer's love. Isaiah 44, please, verse 23. The Redeemer's sovereignty. I'm glad this God that loves me has all of the authority that he needs to be God. I'm thankful this God that loves me, that's going to always love me, has the authority to be God. One writer described the sovereignty of God as the exercise of his supremacy. I tell you again, God's going to be God. Somebody else may be president. Y'all may run me off and get another preacher. God's never going to get run off. He's never going to retire. He's never going to have to be replaced. And he's always going to have the authority to be God. Isaiah 44, please. Look with me in verse 23. Sing, O ye heavens, for the Lord hath done it. Shout ye lower parts of the earth, 
Break forth into singing, ye mountains, O forest, and every tree therein, for the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens above, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. You understand, God's not there in heaven in a great board meeting figuring out how to operate this thing. How do we keep this thing going? God's God. Look with me, please, to to chapter 45 of Isaiah and verse 5. Excuse me, Isaiah 45, verse 5. I am the Lord. Notice this, I am. It's, it's It's a theme throughout the scripture. It means God is always present tense. Hmm? God is always present tense. You're never going to find God used to be this. Or God at one time could do this. I am the Lord, there's none else. Solitariness. There's no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. God was working and we didn't even realize it in our past that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, there's none else. I form the light. Remember in the book of Genesis, God said, let there be what? Light. And what happened? The most powerful energy source the scientists know anything about came into existence. God said, let there be light. All of a sudden, there's the sun. Now they say there are planets, they say, and stars out further out in space that exceed the sun. But they've really got no way of measuring those things. The sun, the light. Verse 7, I form the light and create darkness. Not only did God create and speak into existence this great sun, he also controls it. Hmm? The Soviets and the United States and the Red Chinese, they have created all of these horrific ballistic missiles And they're all scared to death of them that somebody's going to lose control of them. God hasn't created anything that he doesn't govern with the word of his mouth and at his whim or pleasure. Reading on. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Drop down, ye heavens, from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open, and let them bring forth salvation, and let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Let the potsherds strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioneth, What makest thou? Or thy work he hath no hands. Woe unto him, that's warning unto him, that saith unto his father, What begettest thou? Or to the woman, What hast thou brought forth? Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and his Maker, Ask me of things to come, concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands, command ye me. I have made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens, and all their host have I commended. I have raised him up in righteousness, and I will direct all his ways, so on and so on and so on. That's our Redeemer. He's always going to be God. He's always going to be in control. He's never going to get run off. He's never going to get laid off. They're going to have to worry about replacing him, the Redeemer's sovereignty. 
Two verses in chapter 46, hurrying on. Verse 9 and verse 10 of Isaiah 46. Notice how many times we're called to remember. Verses we just read. And then again here in chapter 46, verse 8. Remember this, verse 9. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, there's none else. I am God, there's none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. From ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Remember the Revelation 4.11, that verse I use so often. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. You see, this world's not all about me and my fun. When my grandbabies were little, I thought it was cute. They were all about fun. Now, to me, it's not so cute. Now all I, I, I get frustrated. And, and that's, a, that's a sad thing. That's an incorrect thing on me. But I, I get frustrated. It's like all they want is fun. All they want is their pleasure. They just eat up with selfishness, it seems. You know? And they want it easy. And they don't want to have to work for it. You know? And I'm thinking, God is going to be God. Notice our Redeemer's comfort and our Redeemer's help. Isaiah 41, verse 10. Isaiah presents to us a marvelous Redeemer. Isaiah 41, verse 10. What a comforting verse. We're promised our Redeemer's comfort and our Redeemer's help. Verse 10 of Isaiah 41. Fear thou not. Now, I tell you again, folks, God never says there's nothing to be afraid of. He just says, fear not. We have an enemy. He's Genesis. He's the serpent. Right? He's the serpent. We have the sword of the Spirit. There's not a snake in this world that you can't handle with a good sharp sword. A sharp blade. I was mowing the brush in the back of our place there in Houston. It was right, our north boundary was Hall's Bio. And I was mowing with a big mower and I stepped in some brush and a cottonmouth water moccasin come up and just caught my pants just like that. I just backed up pepperonis out of that dude and went on to mowing my brush. It was a deadly snake. I was talking to, uh, to uh, Brother Bill Rutledge. That's Brother Ross's son-in-law. I had a very good talk with him a while back and they're going to make the trip up here and get to baptize him. But he said he, they killed he, right there by their garage they killed a six-foot, seven-inch timber rattlesnake. Now, that's a big snake, and that's a deadly snake. Bill Rutley said, yeah. He said, they're protected. Evidently, not very well. <laughs> but uh, our enemy, the devil, and then he's likened to a lion. So when God says, fear not, you interpret Scripture with Scripture. God never says there's nothing to be afraid of. He says that just be so equipped, so knowledgeable, that you're not fearful. If I embarrass him, I'll embarrass him, and he'll deal with me later. I wrote an eight-hour shift with Vince one time. And I said, what do I need to bring? Nothing. Maybe a flashlight, he said. I said, I got a big old mag light. He said, nope, don't, you can't have what they call a skull crusher. (laughs) So we go, and we go, and we have to, burglar alarms are going off. 
and we pull up there, and he just gets out and just walks right up there. He's looking. He's got a bulletproof vest on. He's got a sidearm. He's got the skull crusher. I got a little mag light about that long. <laughs> so I'm just kind of, you know, sneaking around kind of right behind him. What's the, what, where are you going with this, preacher? It was a fearful situation. When I left there that night, I'm saying to myself, they don't make enough money or carry enough guns. That's what I do. You know, but to, to get to this, he had the equipment. He had the training. He had the knowledge of how to use the equipment. So he wasn't afraid. Am I making any sense? He says, fear thou not. Why? Here's the great thing. The Redeemer's comfort. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. I was a little bit fearful, but not too much. You know why? I was with him. See, God said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. His help. He said, fear thou not, for I am with thee. I will strengthen thee. I will help thee. Do you ever feel weak spiritually? See, I'm getting old, old, old to me in my thinking. And I've told you about this the other day. I had to lift something that I couldn't lift. And my son Christopher, it was a, a, a trailer tongue, a, a big tandem axle trailer. And I couldn't, I said, well, we'll just have to jack that up. Christopher walks up, grabs it, picks it up, and set it on the bumper. And I just, nee, nee, nee. I'm not ready for my son to be stronger than me. That's, that's, I don't like that at all. You know what? Can't change it. I don't think. I'm not fixing to go get on a Charles Atlas weightlifting program or something. I started that for a while, and now my shirts won't button around my neck. Isn't that not any stronger, just foolishness, vexation of spirit. Aren't you glad we have a Redeemer that loves us? He's always going to love us. He's always going to have the authority to do what he says. Huh? How many times have I wanted to do something and then something interfered and I couldn't do what I wanted to do? That's never happened to God. Nobody's ever made God go back and do this here. What am I going to do now? Hmm? I, I, Brother Bryant was preaching one time. He said, nobody's ever made God do this. <laughs> He's God. He's always going to be God. He's always going to be our Redeemer. He's always going to love us. And he'll always be able to help us. The day will never come when he can't help us anymore. Let's go back to my dad. He can't help me, and I can't help him anymore. Do you know what? My heavenly Father can still help me and he can still love me. He can still love on me. Isn't that something? Song of Solomon says, with his left hand he doth hold me, with his right hand he doth embrace me. The Bible, we sing sometimes leaning on the everlasting God. Deuteronomy says, the eternal God is our refuge. Underneath are the everlasting arms. Isaiah's Redeemer. The great thing about this is Isaiah's Redeemer is my Redeemer. If you are a child of God this morning, Isaiah's Redeemer is your Redeemer. If you are not a believer... If you are not a child of God today, Isaiah's Redeemer is Isaiah's Redeemer. And my Redeemer, but he's not yours. That's something to think about. Ephesians 2 tells us we're without Christ, we're without God, without Christ, 
and without hope. Let's stand together. That's